Happy 50th Monday Madness. It's the 50th episode. We don't actually have anything particularly special planned because I think that's the nature of this show. It's topical. It's week to week. We can't exactly forego discussions on all the craziness that has happened in the world of movies and TV this week because we have the Emmy nominations. The actors are officially on strike from the Screen Actors Guild now as well. And we certainly support them doing that. Absolutely much like the writers as well. Everybody's on strike. It's a crazy time in Hollywood. But we have three pretty big trailers, one of which I consider the most trash bag thing I've ever seen in my entire life, and one of which Janine considers rather boring looking. Perhaps if you're watching this on the YouTube channel, you can tell by our captions which is which. But we also have <laughs> a review, or Janine has a review of Talk To Me. We've got some more Deadpool pictures. We've got a favourite spy movie, a historical biopic, and of course, ending with the game. All of it today. Welcome to the Madness. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Monday Madness with Morgan and the Machine. My extra long intros are getting extra longer, Janine. Yes, we wow. love it here. We love it. We love it here. We do whatever we want. This is our chill kickback show where it's a little loose. So, you know, Very. just go with the flow. 50 episodes in and my intros are just getting longer and longer <laughs> and more and more waffly. But that feel, it feels good, doesn't it? It feels good. 50 yes. episodes of Monday. Yes. Night. And you did say we didn't have anything particularly interesting or special today, but we do have maybe we have, a bit we of have an, an announcement things. of potentially something new that we're doing on the channel. So I oh, think that's, that's true. pretty yes. special. Yeah, it is. It is special. We, we always have interesting things to say, but it's not like a it's not like, for example, the milestone episodes we've done of other shows of the of you know it's a wonderful podcast. The main show of Morgan hasn't seen that have been very defined. Yes, and, we'll, and we'll, we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there with one hundred. I think we will. I think <laughs> we certainly will. Um, but yes, I don't know. Did you want to uh, uh, announce your special little something or our special little something? Um, we had an exciting announcement last <laughs> week. We've got another one now. Yes. Well, I think, you know, when we get into the Emmys discussion, I think that will be very topical to that. So, um... okay. Do you want to do it then? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, um, what should we start with today? I suppose we'll start by asking the question because when we're, we're not here to mess around today oh, no. as much as we all <laughs> would like to, and as much as I will try and drag out any conversation to an extortionate length as I usually like to do because I like the sound of my own voice. I don't really. I just kind of i think you kind of do that, that's why we, we're getting the longer intros <laughs> it's not why it's not why it's <laughs> sure, it's, sure I, can't help it. I can't sure, help it it's just it's just <laughs> natural um so Janae. <laughs> so many things are so morgan um some pretty serious news in Hollywood right now with the actors joining the big strike that the writers have been going through um, and the studio heads being kind of terrible. Um, you know, Very for, terrible. You know, we had word that some of them were saying things like, we're just holding out until they start losing their homes, you know. Um, yeah, that's nice. Yes, and now we have Bob Iger talking about their demands are um, like not sustainable or not, you know, they don't make any sense and they're not feasible what they're asking for. When he's somebody who makes millions of dollars in, yeah, in a, I'll, I'll, he literally makes, I think, more than a writer's salary that they would make in a full year. Um, just uh, that's his pay. He makes like seventy four thousand dollars. That's his his pay. <laughs> I I don't what like a day 
God, doesn't he make like twenty something million dollars? Yeah, that that's like his that? that's his salary. Like somebody gets twenty dollars an hour, he gets like seventy four thousand dollars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Ah, I see. Like hourly rate, you mean? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um. You're not sustainable, Bob. Let's just let's just say yeah. that. I mean, you're better than the last Bob because he did really mess things up at kind of yes. Disney, didn't he? But you can't be coming out with statements like that. You're super villainizing yourself. Especially when you're the ones who don't create anything. Like, no. It's crazy. So, um, you know, seeing the the whole thing with the Oppenheimer actors having to just leave their premiere right in the middle of it because yeah. the strike kind of went through. So, And it's um, not that, like, you know, it's it's not that people don't want to work. I think this is the the always the situation with strikes. It's not that these people don't want to work. It's that they want just better conditions. It, because the, yeah. these actors clearly love acting. You know, they they, yes. they want to be doing that. I follow what? this actress, Constance Marie. Um, she's probably best known for the show Switched at Birth, or she was she played um, Selena's mom in Selena, and um, okay. she was she's on TikTok, and so she was talking about this, and she kind of showed like her residuals for the show Switched at Birth that that streaming services are still streaming her show. And then she showed how much she's getting paid, and it's like four cents, seventy cents, yeah. like those. That's what she's getting for them using her likeness, her face, her performance in these repeat streamings of this show that she was on for what, like five seasons. Um, and that those are the residuals she's getting to have to live off of now in this time where she's not going to be working. Um, so, you know, they're asking for things like that to, to you know, have inflation, you know, accounted for. In, in you know because the model that they're using for how to pay actors is a very old outdated model it needs to be updated to what's out there now ai and things like that so yeah. um yeah i think there definitely needs it's... to be a reevaluation of how actors get compensated because streaming wasn't a thing when a lot of these people started ai wasn't a thing when these people started it's a whole different ball game when it comes to tv um and movies and how we consume them and and how we're able to watch them and how they're made so i think that you know how actors get compensated um needs to reflect those changes and and that evolution yeah, it, it's a very, it's obviously a very tough situation. At the end of the day, it all boils down to the same thing, though, doesn't it? With with both, you know, the actors, the writers, and really any striker in any industry. Treat them as human beings, not as workhorses or yeah. numbers. Yeah. And, you know, it'll kind of, it'll be, you'll be better off for doing that. Yeah, but how how it's do all... these studios think they can sustain all these movies and shows getting halted? Like, how do they think that's going to? Well, this is the, they're not going to lose thing, on that. It? This is the thing: is that I think they know they are. They're just it's the most elaborate game of chicken possible. It's yeah. who can fold first, and you know whether it's five wealthy, super wealthy studio heads or you know hundreds of thousands of unionized writers and actors um who's gonna who's gonna cave in first yes that's, like, that's that is that, that's the gameplay some, for, for some reason that is the ultimate gameplay and yes. it, it's, it's bad that it's like that yeah you just have to throw your support towards those people striking in, in this particular industry because they they're wanting fair compensation they're wanting fair work and to not be to not have these potential things in the contracts like this thing that has come out that apparently um i don't know if this was Iger as well was this Iger as well that said something like oh yes we'll pay you one time and then do a scan of your face and then use it forever 
because in anything we want. Oh my gosh! If, no. Even if you're a back, even if you're a background actor, uh, and apparently this this was presented as a good thing. No, that's not a good. That's the opposite of a good yeah. thing. It's just it's it's. I mean, it should come as standard, and I'm sure we said this when the writers' strike started, but pay individuals per job basically that is, and that is the ultimate thing i think about this is that they're not being paid per job almost or at least fairly per job yeah you know it's it's a, it's a weird yeah situation. and i mean if you were going to have a show that you make and then it's going to be shown um you know because it's not really going to be a syndication type situation like like cable shows back in the yeah. day it's going to be a thing that's going to be on streaming for as long as it's going to be you know on so yeah. i think actors need to see residuals for something like that have it as part of yeah. their contract if you're going to be if your show is going to be aired on hulu and netflix then, then you need to be you get yes you get some outlet. type of compensation for however many streaming services are using your show uh yeah. i don't think that's a uh far-fetched thing to even ask for i mean between the eight heads I, I saw something that said between those eight men who run these studios they made yeah. i think almost a billion dollars last year yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's it, it, it's a situation of the super wealthy just want to continue to get super wealthy and don't really care about anybody else and like i said super villainizing themselves yeah like bob Iger literally said yeah this it's out of the realm of possibility what they're asking for and then like the reporter asked him how and he's like i can't answer that <laughs> like what yeah because, because he might have to lose out on what three million of his 25 million right you're already mm. making enough like it's weird. Oh, it's, so, it's so gross. It's, 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 so it's, a, it's, a, it's a horrible mentality, yeah. but for God's sake, we are fully supportive of the actors' strike and yeah. and the writers, and we hope that you know we hope it ends soon because we hope they get what they want. Yeah, and there's so many great projects that are in the works that now are going to be halted. Yeah. Things that I want to see and support and. Um, Things that going. they want to continue working on. Exactly. Things that, that ha they have money invested in. So I don't know why they think this is going to be a yeah. smart move for them to not even consider some of these things. So it's crazy. I don't know. Anyway, support the actors, support the yes. writers in their strikes. You know, if, if you don't, then you're not really thinking like a human being, are you? So yes well mm -hmm. with, <laughs> with no production of any new content this might give you morgan an opportunity to catch up on all of these shows that have been nominated yeah. for emmys that you haven't seen and it's quite a I've bit i was i like two or, <laughs> like two or three shows of everything that's been nominated i surprised myself i've actually seen or kind of yeah. am aware of most of mostly everything i feel like there's quite a bit when i was going through that i'm like okay i've seen that i've watched that you know um so i feel pretty okay about um um, what I've seen, but in talking to you and realizing you haven't seen a ton of these shows, I am bad with <laughs> yes, I am. Well, well, hence the announcement that um, you know, in learning that <laughs> your your TV knowledge has is just as good as your movie knowledge in terms of 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 the amount of things you've consumed. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> Can I preface this by please saying I watch a lot of older TV. Just like you watch a lot of older movies. Just um, like I watch a lot of older movies. Exactly. So uh, we are starting a brand new show right here on the YouTube channel. A bit of a spinoff of Morgan Hasn't Seen. Uh, where it's going to be Morgan Hasn't Seen TV. And there'll be a few episodes Janine Hasn't Seen TV as well. Um, where. Will. We kind of watch a few episodes of a TV show. Morgan's watching for the first time, and we'll have um, kind of little breakdown discussions on the episodes as we would do. On
on the Morgan Hasn't Seen YouTube channel talking TV shows. So we'll have a couple of shows that we'll be watching and talking about in rotation and the episodes will be released sporadically. Um, but I think we're going to have uh, our first two episodes of the show potentially being released this month. So look out yes. for that. So yes. It's going to be really fun. Mm -hmm. We're basically just going to be taking, you know, we're just discovering an entire run of a certain show. And yeah. whether it's one that you haven't seen, Janine, we'll, we'll be getting into that. Plenty that I haven't seen, of course. Um, but, yeah, going on an entire full journey with a TV show. Um, like we say, not structured and, and strict in terms of episode releases or, or video releases or anything like that. It will just be on the It's a Wonderful Podcast YouTube channel as well. We're, we're not going yeah. to put these on the um, the main the podcast, podcast feed. feed. It, it is a separate thing, like you said, it, it is that kind of spin-off of Morgan Hasn't Seen. that It's kind of more open. It's almost yeah. more thorough than something like Morgan hasn't seen as well. Yes. And so we're going to try to talk depending on like how long the show run is. We might, we'll probably talk like two episodes of the show each, each show. Yeah. So, yeah. And this will feature a, an awful lot of newer TV that isn't too long. So, you know, yeah. so, you know, you, you don't end up lasting far, far too long, but there'll be some, uh, There'll be some old favorites in there as well, <laughs> yes. for sure. From both our sides, from, yes. from you know, both you having you uh, having not seen it and me having not seen it. But yes, okay, the Emmy nomination. Yes. <laughs> 2023. Do, do we want to quickly run through, I, I think, the major few categories at least? Yeah. Um, and see what we think of those. Again, this will be me not knowing a great deal about <laughs> a lot of these because I just haven't seen them, um, which is unfortunate. Janine, you will be able to say much more than me. For best drama series, we have Andor, Better Call Saul, The Crown, House of the Dragon, The Last of Us, Succession, The White Lotus, and Yellow Jackets. Yes. Any um, <laughs> I'm excited Andor got nominated because I really loved that show. That actually kind of uh, solidified itself as my favorite of the Star Wars shows. Yeah. Um, I just loved the style of it, the story of it, and um, just seeing, you know, this character that we, we know to be this great kind of revolutionary um be so pessimistic at the start and so i'm really excited to see how he gets to where he ends up in rogue one um yeah. as this person so much believing in the cause um so the way they kind of started that journey for him was just really interesting so i'm really loving that show um, but so what will win will definitely be succession right because everybody bangs yeah on, bangs on about yes succession. and everyone wants better call saul because it it, it had its last season and it's ended but end. also but yeah. also it's also the end of succession as well um so the only shows here i've seen are andor house of the dragon the last of us and white lotus um okay. my friends were um when I was headed to LA one weekend, it was the weekend that both Barry and Succession were having their season finales. So I think maybe like two days before I was about to come up, my friends were like, we're going to do a whole watch party of the two finales. And these were two shows like I had started Barry like so long ago and then kind of just fell off. And same thing with Succession. Like I watched like the first maybe four episodes and then all of the characters were terrible and I hated all of them and there's no one, literally no one to root for. So I just gave up on succession. I don't know why I gave up on Barry. I was enjoying it, but um, I, I was like, okay. The of succession though, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is. Um, so I gave up on succession, but so in the two days that I had, I was like, okay, I can either binge Barry, which I think the episodes are like 30, 40 minutes or succession where the episodes are like an hour. So I went for Barry and I was able to binge all of Barry before I got to L.A. that weekend um, and then ended up just kind of watching recaps, <laughs> like season recaps okay. videos on Succession. So I'm kind of aware of. So I was able to make sense of the finale uh, with that show, even though I hadn't really watched it. Um, but I'm glad The Last of Us got a nomination. I That show was really good. Um and uh yeah house of the dragon as well really good i've never seen better call saul i watched 
Breaking Bad. So I don't know why I just never got into Better Call Saul. I've never seen The Crown. Yellow Jackets is like one of those ones I'm on my list because everyone's always talking about it. And White Lotus was one. Again, my friends were watching the show. Um, I think they were on like the fifth episode or the episode before the season finale of the second season. Um, and so then I watched that episode and then got when I went home, I ended up just binging the whole series of White Lotus, okay. which I, I really enjoyed. So um yeah, I would I would love to see Andor take it, but yeah, it's probably going to be succession. I think that's the logical conclusion with that one, really. Um there's just in my mind, there's just way too much new tv and because it all all tv is like it's so long it's not like a new movie that you go two hours and you can you know you've seen that then you can talk about that then that's that new tv is coming out every day as well yeah well that takes hours upon hours upon hours. it can take 10 hours to watch yeah you know and then you've got the next, and you, people don't have that time. You've got to pick and choose what you want to watch. Yes, hence why this TV show, Morgan hasn't seen, Janine hasn't seen TV yeah. show, um, will be as sporadic, and will be as sporadic as it is, because it's yeah, difficult to kind of watch so much TV. Um, but out of all of these shows that you haven't seen, I probably, something if I were to throw something into our rotation of the new show, it would probably be White Lotus. I so. I think from what I've seen of that, um, not that I've watched it, but I, I'd be most into that. I think out of yeah. all the ones here that I that I haven't seen, I've seen snippets of the Crown, the odd episode here and there. House of the Dragon, obviously, yes, and yeah. Oh, yes, yeah. But everything else, no. Nope. Last of Us, <laughs> Last of Us, I didn't finish. Um, <laughs> I'm all over the place. I yes. Am. Anyway, um. Best actor in a drama series were Jeff Bridges for The Old Man, Brian Cox for Succession, Kieran Culkin for Succession, Bob Odenkirk for Better Call Saul, Pedro Pascal for The Last of Us, and Jeremy Strong for Succession. Again, it's the battle of Succession, or is it Pedro Pascal, or is it Bob Odenkirk for finishing off Better Call Saul? Yeah, I think people are going to want Bob Odenkirk, but I don't think it'll be him. I haven't heard of The Old Man um no neither have I. I i think it's going to be someone from succession but obviously i want pedro Pascal because um he was great in the last of us particularly that season finale um do the succession people cancel each other out in this sense and pedro um if anyone is to be nom to win from there i think it would be jeremy strong yes he seems to be the one people talk about the most yeah yes <laughs> From what I see, at least, yeah. anyway. Um, but there's always the chance when multiple people from the same thing get nominated that they, they all cancel, kind of just cancel each other out. Yeah, you know? so it could be bad. There's always that risk. Yeah. Best actress in a drama series: Sharon Horgan for Bad Sisters. Kind of interested in that one, by the way. Yeah, I haven't gonna... seen much of it. Yeah. But I like Sharon Horgan. Uh, Melanie Linsky for Yellow Jackets, Elizabeth Moss for The Handmaid's Tale. I didn't realize that was still going on. Yeah. Bella Ramsey <laughs> for The Last of Us, Kerry Russell for The Diplomat, and Sarah Snook for Succession. Yes, um, I'm really excited for Bella Ramsey. She was really great. Um, well, they were really great on um, um, The Last of Us. But I think, yeah, that's the only show out here that I've seen is, is The Last of Us. So it's the old, yep, it's the only show that I've seen anything of. Yeah. Um, definitely. And she was good from what from what I saw of her. She was. Yeah. Or they yes. were. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um <laughs> yeah, Bella Ramsey. Give it Bella Ramsey. Why not? Yeah, just give it to give it to them. <laughs> why, why, why not? Um, best supporting actor in a drama series, F. Murray Abraham for White Lotus, Nicholas Braun for Succession, Michael Imperioli. For White Lotus, Theo James for White Lotus, Matthew McFadden for Succession, Alan Rook for Succession, <laughs> Will Sharp for White Lotus, and Alexander Skarsgård for Succession. I wonder if it will be anybody 
from the white lotus or succession. or succession yeah that's ridiculous <laughs> like that i don't think ridiculous. i don't I think f murray abraham should have been nominated he's literally just pay, playing a pervy old man only to learn that i think it's kind of come out that he really is a pervy old man no so, not f murray <laughs> abraham i he... want to i want to say i saw something recently that he, he had some you know new no, um accusations come good. around <laughs> um but yeah i think i think matthew mc mc mcfaden he he should be he i've should never be. known how to pronounce matthew. i know is it fadian is, is it, it Fadden? I don't <laughs> yeah know. yeah there's a weird y in there i <laughs> Um, but if you watch him, like he's become this whole thing as you know, Mr. Darcy and the and the slow walk, you know, with his coat billowing yes, in the breeze, and then his succession, he's kind of this idiot. <laughs> like, okay, um, okay. only to surprise everyone by the end. Um, but uh, yeah, he's he was great. He was definitely playing a, a really interesting uh, kind of you know shit on character um, who was kind of seen as an idiot. Um, so, okay. uh, yes, I would give it to him. I feel like all the other White Lotus people are the people who did kind of the least. <laughs> Maybe they just, oh, I don't know what, I don't even know why it would look like that. Like, why not just use, surely there are other supporting performances. Exactly, in other shows, and, yes. Right, it doesn't yes. make and sense. And the fact that. that nobody from Andor got nominated for acting. Um, but like 17 people from both Succession and White Lotus did it. It's weird. That's yeah. weird to me. Yeah. Supporting actress, you've got Jennifer Coolidge for White Lotus, Elizabeth Debicki for The Crown, uh, Megan Fahey for White Lotus. I don't know how to pronounce that name. I'm sorry. Sabrina Impacitior, I guess, for The White Lotus. I'm sorry. <laughs> Aubrey Plaza for The White Lotus, Rhea Seahorn for Better Call Saul. J. Smith Cameron for Succession, and Simona Tabasco for White Lotus. Well, at least we have a little bit of other. <laughs> yeah, um, but it's mostly White Lotus again. <laughs> it's like all White Lotus. Um, I mean, White yeah, Lotus I mean, good. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm really kind of bummed not to see Fiona Shaw here because she was great in Andor. Oh, yes, right? Right? Um, yeah, I mean, I would give it to Jennifer Coolidge. So. Okay. Uh, yeah. Jennifer Coolidge doing a, an award show speech would be good. It's, Didn't it's she magical. do that last year? Yes, it's great. Uh, okay. Best comedy <laughs> series. Let's do the same for the comedy that we did for drama and then probably call our discussion on the Emmys there. Yes. <laughs> because they these are the two kind of main categories, aren't they? Yeah. Um, best comedy series, Abbott Elementary, Barry the Bear, Jury Duty. The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, Only Murders in the Building, Ted Lasso, and Wednesday. Yeah, so I've seen a good chunk of these. I haven't seen The Bear. That's on my list. Everyone said Jury Duty is really great. I'm also glad to see that uh, uh, James Marsden got nominated for that because he's great and he doesn't get enough love. Um, Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, of course, I've seen that. I haven't seen Only Murders in the Building. I think I watched like the first maybe two episodes, but it's definitely one I want to kind of go back to. Obviously, love Ted Lasso and have seen Wednesday. So, um, I so would give it to everybody goes on about the bear, right? Yeah, as well. yes, yeah. From everything I've seen about it, how is that a comedy, right? Isn't it kind of like messed up? <laughs> I, don't know. I thought that was like a really disturbing kind of character study of a of a show of people who work in the restaurant industry. And yeah, stuff. of like a, a yeah. weird kind of messed up, stressed out chef. If anything, like dark comedy, but not like comedy, ha ha comedy. Like, like in, not in the elementary. Same... That's yeah. comedy, right? Yeah. Even Barry. Yeah, it's pretty isn't dark. That, isn't that like kind of messed but up? But it's it's it definitely it's definitely before. played. It's definitely played for comedy for sure. Um, I would give Wednesday. it to Ab comedy? I would give it to Abbott. Sure. I would give it to Abbott or Ted Lasso. Okay. But um, yeah. But wasn't this last season of Ted Lasso, or does it go from this from the year before? I always get confused. With yeah, you. so I would think maybe Ted Lasso would be nominated for another year, but. For season two, yeah, not three, because people didn't like three, right? Yeah, it I definitely was. It I was hear. the it was the weakest season for sure. Okay, 
Yes. Well, best um, best actress in a comedy series, Christina Applegate for Dead to Me, Rachel Brosnahan for Mrs. Maisel, Quinta Brunson for Abbott Elementary, Natasha Leone for Poker Face, Jenna Ortega for Wednesday. Natasha Leone got a lot of love for doing for that. For Poker Face, Poker yes. Face. I've been meaning to watch that, but I haven't seen it yet. Um, I would yeah. give it to Jenna Ortega because despite what people think of the Wednesday show, whether they liked it or hated it, they loved her performance. She was very oh, good. Yes. She was very good. I think that's a good that's a good selection of people. I like those people. Yes. Let's just let's just say that I like all of those people and would yeah. be happy to see them win awards. Yes. Um Best Actor in a comedy series, Bill Hader for Barry Martin Short. I don't really like Martin Short for only murders in the building. <laughs> Jason Siegel for shrinking. Jason Sudeikis for Ted Lasso and Jeremy Allen White for the bear is it probably going to be the bear guy i mean maybe i would give it to bill Hader. also jason siegel was really great i loved shrinking i like my co-worker had told me about it and it's such a good show it's really funny also hits like those emotional beats really well it's from uh, it's written by and, and created by brett goldstein who was on ted lasso okay. and jason siegel so um definitely kind of has the same comedic heart as ted lasso for sure um so yeah i would love to see jason siegel get it but bill Hader, he was able to do a lot of great comedic work but also a lot of dramatic work as well um on barry so okay yeah. well supporting actor in a comedy series speaking of brett goldstein he's up for this yes for ted lasso uh, alongside anthony carrigan for barry phil dunster for ted lasso james marsden for jury duty eben moss backrack for the bear or eben moss backrack tyler james williams for abbott elementary and henry winkler for barry yes henry winkler was actually really great on barry I would just personally like just want to give love to James Marsden. I haven't seen Jury Duty, but I know I saw the concept of it was really funny and like clips of it looked really funny. So, I mean, I would just want to give it to James Marsden just because I love him and I feel like he doesn't get enough credit for stuff. So, um, but I would maybe give it to Henry Winkler because he was he was okay. very, very, yeah. Okay. And best supporting actress in a comedy series, Alex Borstein for Mrs. Maisel, Io Edabiri. For the bear, Janelle James for Abbott Elementary, Cheryl Ralph for Abbott Elementary, Juno Temple for Ted Lasso, Hannah Waddingham for Ted Lasso, and Jessica Williams for Shrinking. I mean, I I love Hannah Waddingham. She's so great. And like she talks about, you know, kind of how the show saved her, saved her life and her career and did so much for her. And like, um, you know, she was a struggling actress who is so talented at so many things. And Ted Lasso kind of gave her the stage to really show people what she can do. And she's amazing. So I love her. So I would love to see Hannah Waddingham win. Um, but Janelle James, she's absolutely hilarious on Abbott Elementary. Okay. She, she's the principal, but she's like super lazy, never wants to do anything, just like blows off her job all the time. And is, so she's. I really, really need to watch that. <laughs> it's really, really great. You would love that. it. Like if you like The Office, if you like Parks and Rec, it's very much that kind of documentary style because I think it's kind of like a documentary people watching them and like, you know, doing a documentary yeah. on the school. So it's very much like that. Um, it's really funny. And Janelle James is hilarious. It's just kind of this principal who just really doesn't <laughs> give a shit about anything. Um, she, she's really hilarious. So, yeah. I really should. I really yes. should. Well, we're, we'll. there's plenty more Emmy nominations, of course. Who yes. Who uh, show love to them. But, of course, we have plenty of other things to yes. talk about today. And just another um, shout out for Andor. I'm, I I would have loved to see Andy Serkis get a nomination for his part in Andor as well. Yeah, for, like, guest yeah. appearance or whatever that, that nomination is. But, um, yeah, which but I think... Doesn't. But I want to say Nick Offerman um, got nominated for... I his, think him and Murray uh, Bartlett did. Yes, for, for, for The Last of Us. So I, I'm excited yeah. about that. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, yes, we, 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 that was we a beautiful. Like that. that was a beautiful episode. Yeah, like we say, plenty of other nominations. Yes. Those are just the the major two, the main ones. major acting ones. Yeah, um, that we wanted to just get into a little bit on today's thing. Uh, thing on today's show, we 
also have a few more pictures released from Deadpool 3 showing uh, Hugh Jackman's Wolverine in full yellow gear. Yeah, people got really excited, which is all we'll see because that movie's probably on hiatus now. So, no, oh, definitely, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. Um, I mean, exciting to a point, I, I admittedly like, yeah, okay, it's comic accurate, it's 90s cartoon accurate very good we all like it don't we but there is a reason it should have been left there i do think it looks a little bit silly but, but i think it's that's probably the point for that but i it think it's probably, probably it's probably the point if this movie is not taking itself seriously at all there were some pictures also where you can see like a destroyed fox studios logo kind of in the yes. background in this fight sequence so i think it's very much like deadpool kills the Marvel Universe, Deadpool kills the X-Men universe kind of thing, but he's going yeah. to kill the Fox X-Men universe and or like just the Fox superhero movie universe. So I'm sure we're going to have heroes from all of those movies popping in and he's going to be just killing it because they kind of even set that up in Deadpool 2 with him time traveling and, you know, killing yeah. Ryan Reynolds like as he was reading, the, you know, um, the Green Lantern script and stuff like that. So um, as we... Um... Yeah. As we theorized last week, it would be something like of that. that. Yes. So I think it's it's going to be super silly um, if we ever get to see it, if it ever gets <laughs> made, if these greedy ass people, you know, give the actors what they want. But um, yes, I think I, a lot of people were excited about the comic accurate outfit. And I think that was just supposed to be the silly fun of it. I don't think this movie is taking itself too seriously at all. Um, and I think it's going to be a fun thing playing into just Fox not being an entity really anymore and yeah. and now kind of going to Disney and, and having fun with that and also just playing into a comic run that fits perfectly with that whole concept. Um, so, yeah, and I, I was excited to see the yellow suit for sure. Not to be uh, not to not to bring it down or anything like uh -huh. that, but um is it not a little bit terrifying that this is basically saying, Fox, you're officially dead, we're Disney, ha, ha, ha. Yeah. Which is terrifying. That's called a monopoly, isn't yes. it? So that's not good. As much as you like the game Monopoly, Janine, and you're terrifying at the game of Monopoly, um, it's actually not a good thing done in comedic sense is it making light of that i'm am i reading too much into it i mean probably maybe... not i'm probably not reading too much i mean into no it. i mean it's probably because disney's like essentially making it so they, they can make fun of fox if they want to <laughs> i don't um, know it might come off as a little uh, bit but even bit but i mean but fox had a very wishy-washy run with those characters I well, mean, they did. Yeah, I'm not. Elektra is characters. not a loved movie. Daredevil is not a loved movie. Every other like X Men movie, kind of after three, was just very much this kind of bad, good, bad, good kind of situation. Um, so I, I think they, uh, you know, in terms of their superhero films, I think they could use a little bit of a, hey, what have you been? <laughs> what were you doing? I think, look, kind I, of. I, I think you know. I think I it's think wanted a little fair. bit. Yeah. There is some there is some great Fox superhero movies, or the was, you know, when they were making them, there really is. Some of those X-Men movies are yeah. wonderful. Um I just don't want this to turn into a bigger picture kind of let's remove all Fox movies forever because I don't want to lose them. No, well I think I think it's going to be focused I'm on... I'm reading way too much into it. I know that. Yes, I think it's going to be focused on the superhero movies of and of, of Fox and, and not Fox in general. So... I really don't want that. There's just... It's a slippery slope. I'm, that's all I'm worried about, right? I'm just yes. worried about the slippery slope and all of a sudden we have no fox movies from the 30s anymore no okay. it's not i i really don't think they're gonna go back to the 30s i think it's purely focused on the superhero legacy of Fox. so but even that i don't want them to just remove those movies from existence do they're it as a joke yes, do it as yes joke. Do it of as course joke. of course it's just going to be a joke 
but this is um, what I'm saying. You say this, but people are evil. People are evil. You say this. What but do you I think, think that those movies are just not going to be on any platforms anymore? Who's to say? Who's hey, to say? Well, he he stopped Ryan Reynolds from reading the Green Lantern script, and Green Lantern is still available. So <laughs> it is that is true, yes, but that's also <laughs> owned by another company. Yes. Well, I think I think you're definitely reading too much into it. So I hope I am. Reel it in. I hope I am. I hope I am. Let's get into some of these trailers then that we have today. Um, Because we have three fairly major trailers that came out this past week. Um, What should we start with, Janine? Uh, I don't even know what we should start with mm. because there's just one screaming at me at the moment that's just um well we can start with napoleon um start with napoleon then okay i mean i'm not a huge historical figures type movie person um and this i don't care about napoleon i don't but does it not look like see, <laughs> no it looks boring it looks boring to me it just looks boring to me if i'm gonna see anything about napoleon i'm gonna watch bill and ted's excellent adventure where napoleon is being ridiculous and running around a mall <laughs> and here was me in the 80s <laughs> here was me janine planning an elaborate napoleon retrospective for it's a wonderful podcast <laughs> yeah no thank you when this movie comes okay. out that you now will not want to do okay well we can watch you haven't seen the bill and ted movie so we can do the bill and ted trilogy where napoleon is featured in the first one where oh. bill and ted collect a bunch of historical figures to help them with their history report <laughs> or we can watch 1927's Napoleon, Waterloo from 1970 with Rod Steiger, and then and then this new one. Yeah, I don't know. Nothing about this trailer got me excited. It just looked kind of boring to me. I know Joaquin Phoenix I think is a great, a- great actor. Of course, because you love history, but I don't know. <laughs> like... <laughs> I guess it has to just come at me at a certain angle to to get me excited about it or interested about it. Um, but this did not really do that. I mean, that's so. that's fair. This is this is entirely personal opinion. I'm not saying I love Napoleon. I know a great deal about Napoleon. I just think this looks like a really top quality, first rate telling of the movie. story. Yeah. And I'm always into that kind of thing because you can get historical movies that are, you know, that that don't look good, that sometimes look cheap, sometimes look kind of over theatrical or, or yeah, or very kind of Oscar baity, yeah, Oscar baity or things like that. And nothing about this Napoleon trailer comes across as that. It comes across as a real genuine interest in getting underneath the ca- the the person of napoleon and then seeing you know what he a was like personal side of him what he yeah what he was like as a person because he was obviously a phenomenal military leader phenomenal speaker a phenomenal you know leader in general but also a complete maniac yeah you know and a tyrant and just ruthless to a fault and sell you know kind of arrogant to a fault um i think you're gonna see all that joaquin phoenix is is a perfect kind of actor to play that kind of thing yeah i think as well um unfortunately it's not in french but that would have perhaps been going a little bit too far too far yeah uh, to have it all in french if this was a if this was robert eggers napoleon and not ridley scott's napoleon you'd be getting it in then it would probably french. be more accurate yeah <laughs> but then again having said that the northman wasn't exactly all in old norse was it it was yeah that's true it, it was in english so maybe i'm wrong in saying that I think this Napoleon movie, I mean, Ridley Scott still has so much energy into his 80s. 
and yeah. it's phenomenal to see him want to pull to tackle off a big big movie like so, this a big story like yes. this yeah such a massive movie yeah. such a big scale movie I commend this him for that. Battle, but... You're gonna you're gonna get these huge <laughs> battle scenes. The costuming looks yeah. beautiful. Yes, okay, some of the visuals look a little bit kind of dark and muted. I don't necessarily love it looking so desaturated. I think that's why you can go and watch, you know, Waterloo or something like that that is a little bit kind of brighter looking. Brighter. Yeah. Um it's it it, it seems to just be the way of doing modern historical movies is darken them, and it's a little bit unfair, I think, on the past, because people like yourself, perhaps, can look at them and go, oh, that looks grey and boring and horrible, we don't like that. But really, <laughs> it probably should be a little bit more colourful. Maybe. Um, and that's just visually more colourful. Yes, it can be tonally as dark and tonally as as weird as it is but visually it perhaps should be more colorful but i still think it looks wonderful very very authentic very very gripping yeah. and i think it's going to be a real a real epic a real epic and i mean that in a movie sense because we don't get too many true epics anymore Fair. You know, this is not the 50s. Yeah. Um, it's nice to see one that looks to be of, of real, real quality. Great quality and has a bunch of history people that I follow really, really excited for okay. it as well. So I, I, I like that. I love, I, I really do love the look of, uh, of this Napoleon movie. And it makes me want to go and watch the other, Those other ones. Napoleon movies, especially the. 1927 one which i've never seen it's like four and a half hours long <laughs> I, I, I. <laughs> um, and he's actually french but he's apparently just game changing Great. so okay naturally a, a, from a discovery <laughs> standpoint yes a four hour not, movie in not, french of course you yes see that. not not for <laughs> um not for not for necessarily i have to like those movies i am a pretentious pretentiousness <laughs> but it's nice to yes, yes. get into different <laughs> facets of movies, isn't it? This is what we yes, like to do. Of course. Um, that is Napoleon anyway. What about, I mean, I, I want to leave it as long as possible, so please let's talk about the final Blue Beetle trailer. Yes, um, I'm just really worried <laughs> that, well, now... <laughs> um, that this movie already wasn't really getting promoted all that much, and now I don't think it, the actors can really promote it at all. No. Or do press or anything, so now I'm really worried about it. Um, but this movie looks really fun. Um, I liked getting to see more of, of our character in the suit and how it works, and um, it looks like a lot of fun. I like that his family is going to play look like with this new trailer. We got to see more of his family kind of being involved. Uh, like at the end, the grandma's like holding a gun. And, yes. uh, <laughs> uh, so I like that the family is going to be a huge part of this superhero. Um, and I'm kind of helping him and they're all going to kind of be his guy in the chair. It looks like. Um, yeah. So yeah, I really want this movie to do well. Um, I think it looks like a lot of fun, but now I'm kind of worried that, you know, it's just not getting, and now it probably won't be able to get the promotion that it needs. Or the I'm, I'm in a very, though. I'm in a very, very similar mindset to you on this, because yeah. I, I think this movie will suffer heavily from the, the, the era that, we continue to be in of too many superhero movies and yeah. superhero TV and all that kind of stuff where things just get lost. And 15 years ago, this movie would have done really well. Yeah. You know, this movie looks like a hell of a lot of fun and it's giving you know, Zolo married away in a, a, a big role, and you know, a big yes. role moving from Cobra Kai into major a major 
superhero, I say major superhero movies. Blue Beetle's obviously a smaller superhero yeah. than, than your major DC players. And it does come at a very weird time for DC, obviously, because it's it's not exactly a, you know, it's not exactly residue of the past, but it's not exactly the future either. Yes, it's in a weird kind place. Of it's kind singular. of, yeah, it's like a singular thing, but it's also kind of the kickoff of this new phase of DC. And it's following three big failures for DC. So yeah. it's in a, just a really weird position. And now with the strike, there's not going to be, the actors aren't going to be allowed to really, if they're part of that, they're not going to be allowed to promote it at all. And it wasn't really getting a lot of promotion to begin with, I don't think. So, I, I mean, think it's going to be it's going to be the most focused of recent DC movies. Yes. So it's going to be up to the fans to really support this movie and just, because I think a lot of people are aware of it. Um, so yeah. I yeah. I, I I hope it does. I hope it's good. First of all, it, yeah. it certainly looks very enjoyable. I just, I can't see it being super successful, but like you said, I, I hope yes. that, I hope that doesn't turn into I hope any lack of success it has doesn't turn into this movie was bad because I don't think it will yeah be. yes I think if it is not successful it'll be because of circumstances out of its control and not because yeah, it'll be an inherently so bad movie yes because it looks like a lot of fun um it's you know kind of a character it's like it's very much like I think guardians of the galaxy for people who aren't huge comic book fans or comic book people yeah introducing a character that maybe not the mainstream knows and and getting to know them with an actor i think people really fell in love with on cobra kai yeah, um and, and you know uh showing a character from uh, a, a kind of very underrepresented group of people yeah and, you absolutely. know the first, so, the first latin comic book movie isn't it really the first yeah. with a with a latin lead yes. so surely you've got to think a certain community will come out in i mean full yes story, no I matter what so. right yeah so so i hope I, you do i'm hoping I, I have the best of hopes for this movie because i think it looks really good and um yeah yeah so i'm excited yeah. for it this this trailer showed a lot of new stuff that just made the movie look even more fun so and I think the the small the smaller feeling scale of it will help it as well, because yeah. it actually looks like it was filmed on sets, <laughs> and yeah. it was filmed in locations and not in false created arenas. Yeah, <laughs> and and the suit looks really good. Yeah, the Blue Beetle suit looks really good. The the visual effects of this trailer. Yes, like really even good. the suit kind of going on him and get, having this like horror, body horror kind of vibe to it as well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I will be going seeing Blue Beetle definitely. Yes. Um, I, I hope it's as I hope it's as I hope it's as good as it looks. But I don't. I think we'll be. I think we'll have a legacy of being a weird anomaly in dc's yeah. output um and that can be a good thing that can garner you know cult classic status in the future if it wants to i just don't see it having i mean who's to say who's to say it might be the most successful thing dc have done in years it might be yeah it, it, it might it, i don't know it's a yes. strange one it's yeah. a very, very strange. We'll see. Movie. We'll see. Best of hopes for this um, A movie that I hope doesn't do very well at all, and I'm shouting for a reason. Well, we have our whole thing, the two of us, with Willy Wonka. Like, Where is he? We, He's behind me. <laughs> Come on. We absolutely love Willy Wonka. We love to talk the most shit on Grandpa Joe. He is the, the worst villain in movie history. Um... Here we just love making fun of the, the the terrible songs in it and the the funny uh, little... no the one terrible song well the one, the terrible, one terrible song the one terrible song the little girl almost getting hit in the face with the candy counter ah, the weird ah. uh dutch british 
Swedish town, <laughs> random, <laughs> where people speak English and have German accents and like yes. all kinds of nonsense. Um, so, you know, we have a lot of fun with Willy Wonka. It's one of our favorites that we love to discuss and, and make fun of, you know, Grandpa Joe and, and we make Jack fun Albertson of <laughs> and Jack we, Albertson we make... in general, but we absolutely love it. So, because yeah. it's a great movie because it it, it's a wonderful wonderful movie we don't make fun of it from a, a, a laughably bad standpoint we make no. fun of just elements of it because they're just <laughs> weird so bonkers but we, yes we absolutely love it um so we had kind of a, a very visceral reaction i think both of us to this trailer um i i mean. I, 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 I don't know he's what he's brought. doing he has no whimsy he's very kind of boring and bland Incredibly the tone so. of it i think if you can find an, a middle ground of what the original film did and what johnny depp's film did both of them still kind of inherently had the darkness of the book in them like the twisted kind of effed up nature that the book had to some oh, degree yeah. And so the fact that this movie is not even playing into that at all, I mean, it's not taking place at the same time. It's earlier in Wonka's career, but I think it should still have kind of this twisted little bit nature of him being this kind of eccentric. Um, and he's not playing eccentric. Um, he's not playing eccentric. I don't know what he's playing. Timothy yes. Chalamet is a great, great actor. He is. Timothy Chalamet should not be playing shouty cheerful weird and wacky he should no. be playing quietly sad he's good at quietly sad yes that's brooding, what he's good at brooding cool you know man a few words kind of type person exactly if there's like, one person who's not a man of few words, it's Willy Wonka. He's constantly yeah. babbling on talking about any it's such like, nonsense. It's like James Dean playing Willy Wonka. <laughs> like, you know? It's wrong. It is. It's, 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 it's awful. <laughs> it's an awful casting choice. It looks to have absolutely no charm to it whatsoever, no. which is something that certainly Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory has, the book has, and even Tim Burton's Johnny Depp's Charlie in the Chocolate Factory takes the weirdness to an extreme level. Yes, sure. at there has to but be a layer actually, of weirdness in there somewhere. But it's actually somewhat strangely enjoyable. I mean, it's, yes, it doesn't charming. hold a candle. It doesn't hold a candle to... to the 71 Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Yeah. But 2005's Charlie and the Chocolate Factory is not a dreadful remake. It's over long in parts. It's Johnny Depp does weird. come across as very weird in it. But at least he but at least he's coming across as eccentric. At least he's yeah. coming across as weird, yeah. which Willy Wonka is weird. Yeah. Whatever Chalamet is doing here is not little it's upstart not it. Willy Wonka. He's not remotely weird at all. Yeah, no. He's trying not. to like floop his finger around and do something with an umbrella, and just because he's wearing the outfit doesn't mean he's Willy Wonka. Yeah, he's not playing this... into it very well. He's very kind of just dry and bland, and and the world that they're creating, it's like very much like this wannabe Harry Potter kind of vibe, like. Let's just put some it, colorful well, it, things in the background, and and that means whimsy. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not. <laughs> yeah, it's like lazy whimsy. <laughs> lazy whimsy that doesn't work. And yeah. I, I I enjoy nothing about this trailer, yeah. nothing. And I love Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. The whole story. How has this weird movie got made as well before? The actual sequel of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, which is Charlie and the Great Glass Elevator, yeah. where Wonka takes Charlie on a trip, like, to the stars in the Great Glass Elevator, right? Because um, that's where Willy Wonka, that's where the movie finishes. Yeah, just flying right, around it. in the Great Glass yeah. Elevator. Yeah. yeah. It's not where the Tim Burton movie finishes, that's another thing weird that ends up with like 
what's that end up with? Charlie's house in the factory or something like that. Something like that. And then we see all, we actually get to see the kids and you know, all messed up at the end. Oh, we do. Yes, of course. Yeah. Stupid. <laughs> um, but how, why, why, why we're getting a prequel to, or, 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 or an origin story? Of Willy Wonka is not something we need. The reason people like Willy Wonka is because he's a bit of a mystery. We don't know him. Anything goes with Willy Wonka yeah. because you don't know if he's gonna, you know, give you a hug and uh, pat you on the head and say, "Well done, good go on you, enjoy yourself," or actually nearly kill you. Yeah, you don't know <laughs> what he's gonna do. He might do. He might do that, and then a second later, he might almost mutilate you. But yes, this this Wonka has no mystery. He has no style. He's just very, I don't know, just very dry and plain. I hate it. I I, I don't. Yeah, I, I was not mean, into it at I, all. I really, really. Like no, I didn't like anything he was doing in that trailer. And then we have Hugh Grant as an Oompa Loompa. Like, oh, it's vomit inducing. It's absolutely vomit inducing. Why? Why we need to do that? Why can't we just do? Why do we have to CG a small body onto Hugh Grant's head? Why can't we just hire somebody of that size, perhaps, that we did yeah. in the early 70s? Yeah. It worked. It was fine. Nobody thinks it's nobody thinks it's offensive, do they? That the Oompa Loompas happen to be small. Because that's yeah. just... The Oompa Loompas are small, that's fine. Pe some people are that way. Yeah. Hugh Grant's not that way. So surely this is actually offensive. <laughs> right? Yeah. And also, it just looks why weird. is he not speak why is he not overdubbing German? <laughs> because that's as we all know, that's what the Oompa Loompas should be doing. <laughs> and look, okay, if we're going off the book, there's a little bit of like mm, mm, racism. Yes, yes. There is. Of how um, the Oompa Loompas came to be <laughs> the Oompa Loompas in, in Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, the movie, are the best way to do it, where they're just kind of there and, and we don't really know who they are, but they're clearly not like they're clearly not some sort of racist thing. Yes, the, they're orange and green, you know, they don't exist in real life. Yes, and the, I think to the extent of what he says, I think he just says he kind of rescued them, and that's the kind of where we leave it, I want to yeah. say. From from um, yeah, Lander. seventy-one. You, you don't yeah. get the big let's go explanation to the jungle of and... jungle and and kidnap them and enslave yeah. them essentially and then enslave yeah. them. They, that's yes. exactly what's going on. Yeah, but no, I I I've turned a page with Hugh Grant in my life, Janine, as well, to the point where I can respect what he does, and this is going to ruin that. This is going to take me all the way back to just wanting to throw up every time I see him yeah I mean I think I, I made a decent effort in showing you some things of his that you know made redeemed him a little bit for you you but... did you, you really did and I'm afraid this movie is going oh. to ruin that now bummer it's horrible yeah, it makes we were me not want, it makes me want to cry yeah I knew it's it would make good. him. I knew it. I knew I wouldn't like what was yeah. going on here. I really did. I just didn't think it would come across as this. Ugh, which is the only possible noise I can make. Yeah. It's not good. It's really, really not good. For God's sake, let's move on and talk okay. about some things we do like, please, Janine. Because let's get into today's Let's Talk. Well, we had one more thing, actually. Oh, did we? Did we? Sorry. <laughs> yes. Um, oh, we did. Oh, God, I'm sorry. We did. Um, I went to my theater. I think uh, plenty of theaters are doing this now. I think it's a regal thing, particularly, where they do Monday mystery movies. I've gone to quite a few of them um, where they preview a, a newer movie um, before it's wide released. Uh, so I went to one... Um, last monday and it happened to be for the new a24 horror film talk to me so it is an australian i believe horror movie uh basically about a bunch of young people who uh they have this ceramic hand that when you touch it 
and say the words talk to me, you're able to commune with the dead or commune with entities from the other side. Um, they realize that I think you can only you know, have the entity within you for no more than 90 seconds or the entity will want to stay um, and, and kind of possess okay. you. So they end up kind of using this as a fun party game, parlor trick situation. They film each other, they drink, they, you know, have a good time with it and then make sure that, you know, you get the entity out of you before the 90 seconds. So there's always somebody like timing it. So we meet our lead character, um, Mia, who she's lost her mother, presumably to suicide, but her father has never really been honest with her about what really happened. Uh, so I believe she's coming up on, I think, the one year or the two year anniversary of her mother's death. So okay. she's very kind of, you know, so she, you know, when she's approached with this game, she's very much eager to kind mm. of mess around with it, I think, because she yeah. has this weird feeling of death based on, you know, her mom. So she gets kind of into Do it. it. And, you know, one night when they're all kind of playing with this whole game of this, you know, communing with the dead, um, they end up taking it a little too far. Um, demons kind of end up, you know, sticking around where they're not supposed to stick around. Right. And so yes. it becomes like this it. whole mission to get rid of them and, and get things back to normal. So, uh, yeah, I think the pacing is really fast. Like we get into it really quickly. Um I think the visuals are really cool, really scary. Um, there is some kind of self-harm uh, depictions mm -hmm. that are really difficult to watch, like somebody bashing in their head, like on on hard surfaces, which was just very much like, uh, kind of um, very well, visceral. Like, thanks, to the, thanks to the demon or of the Yes, record. thanks to someone being possessed and oh, okay. making them like harm themselves. Um, but yeah, really creepy visuals. I think it's a really well-paced story. Um, I think we get enough time to kind of understand our characters, but they do set up a few kind of character dynamics that they don't really flesh out, you know? So okay. it's like, why set this up if you're not really going to, it's, it's, it's going to factor in, in any kind of big, meaningful way. Um, but it's really fast paced. We get to kind of the horror action pretty quickly. Um, it's really scary and intense and, and it builds really well, I think. So I actually really enjoyed it. I think if you are somebody who likes supernatural horror, because I'm not even someone who really likes possession supernatural horror, but I actually got really into it and really wanted to see where it was going to go and seeing if our characters could get out of this situation with these demons and all of this. Um, so yeah, I found myself really getting into it. Um, I just wish they would have you know, maybe taking the time to flesh out the story, the, you know, character storylines that they had set up a little bit better. But overall, I think, you know, I liked how quick paced it was that we got into things pretty quickly um, throughout the story. So does it fit into that A24 style of kind of small scale weirdness? Yes. So, yes. To? So it definitely feels very small scale, very kind of quiet and comfortable um, in terms of not some kind of big overblown uh, thing that's trying to to do too much or forced jump scares just for the sake of it. I think it's definitely trying to tell an interesting story and um, lean into um, kind of this being able to commune with the dead. Um, you know, that's kind of what causes a lot of the problems um, with with our main character. Um, is kind of her desire to really communicate with her mother. And um, yeah. that that's kind of what kicks off a lot of the, the issues that we have in this movie. Um, so yeah, I like the the pacing of it was really well done. Um, it just feels very small and intimate and creepy. And uh, yeah, so I thought it was a solid supernatural horror flick. Good. Okay. Yeah. I have been interested in seeing this. I just haven't been able to. Uh, yet yeah i do believe point, but... it's a, it has a wide release on july 28th so yes it's not too far away at yeah. all yeah. so I, I certainly will be seeing talk to me good glad yeah. to know <laughs> that it's a really solid horror movie because a really sorry a really solid horror movie is always welcome in my yeah. world janine yes it really is well there we go Let's now 
get into our <laughs> let's talk, of course. I'm sorry for preemptively saying such things. It's not going to be a very long let's talk today, today because we don't have like a big review. Because, of course, and I'm sure we should have probably said this at the very beginning of the episode. Yeah. Um, Mission Impossible, we're not talking about it here. Mission Impossible is being solely and exactly, that's not the right word, talked about and discussed over on Morgan Hasn't Seen All Month. So yeah. our big review of Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1, that you may have been sat here listening and watching this show, thinking, are they not going to be talking about yeah. Mission Impossible? Mission Impossible 7 today. It's like, yes, we are. In two weeks. Two weeks? A little bit. At the end of the month. Um, yes. On, on on Morgan hasn't seen because that is we're we're doing all the Mission Impossible movies yeah. over on Morgan hasn't seen so or any and every discussion on Mission Impossible. Um, if you want to hear all our thoughts on that, then go on over to the main podcast feed. You may already be there if you are listening to this and not watching. Um, and look at Morgan hasn't seen on there because yeah. that's where all our Mission Impossible stuff is. Yes, um, but we did want to take the spy element and apply it to today's Let's Talk, so... We did. Yes, <laughs> we did. Um, but yes, that is where our dead wrecking discussion will, will be found. Be. Yeah. Unfortunately not here. It would have, of course, <laughs> normally been our big main Let's Talk review yeah. for today. Of course it would. Um, but yes, we're doing something particularly fun over on that show... So we are just going to talk. We're, we're going to talk about two movies each that we uh, maybe just want to show some love to because this is nice to do every once in a while. Pick a genre, pick a movie. doesn't have to be the greatest movie of all time in that particular genre or anything like that. Just one we happen to really like that we just want to show some love to. Yeah. We have one spy movie each, Janine. In honour of Mission Impossible, it has to be said. Yes. And uh, Dead Reckoning Part 1 coming out this past week. Um, all I will say, actually, let's just actually say one little thing about Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1. It was very good. I very much enjoyed it. Yes, I did as well. Yes, I, I really did. That's all you're getting for now. Um, <laughs> That's really good. We're talking about, we're going to talk about one spy movie each that we happen to really like and want to show some love to, and one historical biopic each uh, and that's in honor of napoleon because while janine hates napoleon as her caption says and i mean hating napoleon the person isn't necessarily a bad thing and you know that's not a bad thing the movie is just a little bit unfair i mean I, I, I at least my caption is at least hating something that's reasonable <laughs> to hate which is the Wonka trailer. Um, we're going to be talking about one historical biopic we wanted to show some love to as well. Which one did you want to start with, Janine? Um, I guess we can talk biopics. Biopics. Okay, historical biopics. What do you have? What do you want to show um, love to? So the biopic I want to talk about is not as old as, as the story of Napoleon. Okay. Um, it's about uh, Vivian Thomas, uh, the black man who helped um, create the first open heart surgery um, in the film Something the Lord Made. It was a HBO original TV movie um, uh, starring uh, Alan Rickman. He was um, okay. the doctor who helped with with creating the surgery and most f which i think he goes by his actual name now Ooh. um or is this because it was a serious movie so <laughs> well no i think in the movie he went because the movie is from 2004 so in the movie he was most deaf his, his, you know he's originally a rapper and so that yeah. that's his rap name but his, his but if you look him up on imdb he's now going by his actual name yes in bay oh okay um, yes um, so he plays Vivian Thomas. He was a um, like a carpenter. He ended up getting a job in a lab, and um, 
Dr. Blaylock, played by Alan Rickman, kind of noticed him reading the books and taking an interest in the equipment. And and he had been all his life wanted to be a doctor and had been saving up for medical school. And then the bank that he had his money invested in went under and he lost all his savings. And so he ended up, um, you know, uh, Dr. Blaylock ends up taking him on and helping and he ends up helping him kind of figure out um, the, the first open heart surgery. There's this baby who is like, has this blue baby disorder because something's wrong with her heart. She's not getting enough um, blood to her heart. So she's blue. She's like completely blue. So um, they first have to figure out how to replicate what the baby has in a dog so that they can then like figure out because they were doing these tests on dogs um, to figure this out. So they had to kind of replicate that. And Vivian was able to figure that out so they could, figure out how to save this baby. So this was at John Hop- Hops- Hopkins um, where they did this. So um, something the Lord made is just about uh, Vivian Thomas and his contributions to, you know, and, and he ultimately kind of got a honorary doctorate um, okay. um, fine later in life. Um, but um, yeah, so it's kind of about him working with this doctor and, and obviously people like, what are you doing here? You're just a, you know, uh, you know, people yeah. not really acknowledging him because, I mean, there would be situations where um, he's serving food at Dr. Blaylock's party and he's and Dr. Blaylock is talking to other doctors about the things that they're studying. And while Vivian is like serving people, he would chime in with like responses yeah. and people were like, well, what's this waiter talking about? Like, what? Um, so it was like he always kind of felt invisible in his uh, contributions and there are a lot of moments where, you know, for him, he's like, I'm used to being invisible, but at least I want you, Dr. Blaylock, to recognize me. Um, and so there are moments when he has to kind of advocate for himself. He's like, I get other people not noticing me, but Dr. Blaylock, when you don't notice me, like, that is just, you know, you know, it feels wrong. So it's very much kind of the the trials in their, in the friendship that they build and all of that. So it just highlights the, 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 the black man who helped uh create the first open heart surgery so a very important contribution and a very important uh, discovery certain well discovery i suppose but um medical advancement yes so yes gabrielle union is in it as well she plays his wife kira cedric naturally it's 2004 (laughs) yes uh alan uh, rickman's wife is played by kira sedgwick um so yeah yeah, solid nice. movie historical figure Vivian Thomas. <laughs> well, let's just call my historical biopic something drastically different oh, than uh, something the Lord <laughs> made us. Was it something the Lord made us? Was that something the Lord movie? made? You something can find it. It was an HBO original um, movie, so okay. you can you can find it on Max. Um. Well, you know what kind of movies I like, Janine, don't you? You know what kind yes. of movies I like. Um, of a certain age. Mm-hmm. Um, this is from 1935. Of course it is. Um, <laughs> is it in I don't English? Know why you're laughing at me. Is it in English? Yes. yes. It's a movie it about is. royalty people. Royals. It is a movie about royalty people, yes. Um... <laughs> It's the Scarlet Empress with Marlene Dietrich. Yay. Her and Joseph von Sternberg's last um, movie together. Okay. Or, or last movie together, at least in Paramount, um, from their kind of height of, of their director-actress partnership in Paramount of the early 30s. Um, and it's about, it's about Catherine the Great of Russia. Yeah. And her rise to to become um, what she became from just being somebody that was, you know, a child really that was brought in, a teenager that was brought into the Russian court at the time to be married off to the kind of weird child of the then ruler. Yeah. Um. The weird child of the then ruler is, is Peter. He's played by Sam Jaffe, who you you will know as the High Lama from Lost Horizon. Oh, okay. Um, he's really creepy in this movie, by the way. <laughs> in the Scarlet Empress, he looks—he doesn't look like a human being. 
in no. this movie, I don't think. His eyes, I don't think they ever blink. Um, and his kind of teeth just protrude out. He's basically, he's a complete, like, I don't know if Peter was some sort of, you know, kind of result of European royalty in breeding or something like that, but he comes yeah. across as that. Okay. Let's just say he comes across as that. He's a he's not right in the head, and he's not right in the body either. Really, he's unfortunately, you know, Catherine is is brought in to marry this person, yeah. um, but of course becomes basically the well, she is the story is her rise to power. And her rise to power aside from Peter, because she kind of just shuns him aside. She goes with who she wants to go with. She has yeah. affairs, you know, with other people. And he tries rallying, you know, his own guard around him. But Catherine's just getting more and more powerful. And it's Marlena Dietrich. And it's yeah. a perfect, I think almost the height of her movie stardom because to play yeah. an old royal you know in a really super lavish historical production that this is and yeah. joseph von sternberg is all, always excels at filling his frame and filling his sets with so much kind of busyness so much okay. not necessarily mm -hmm. much going on but just artifacts items like there's a table with a lot of things on there and it's not it's the opposite of minimalism it's okay. as though he's like a hoarder of his frame yeah. <laughs> he just like rams like so to much fill, into it, fill it up which looks beautiful when you're in this palace for the entire time it's a beautiful looking movie okay. it's i think i don't know if it's their best movie or my favourite of their movies. And Shanghai Express, I do think I enjoy more. Um, that's maybe because that's more Dietrich playing the mysterious kind of ingenue. Yes. She's good at playing. Um, this is very much her, just the, the, the glare, the Marlena Dietrich glare that she has. Yeah. That, that power that she just conveys the ability to be straight-mouthed and assertive, but it's all about learning to become that. Yeah. And it's all, it's it's that story. Yes, okay, it takes historical liberties, sure. I think every biopic does. it's a beautiful, beautiful-looking movie. Yeah. yeah. It's such a great, such an interesting area because you don't, don't get too many movies about old russian royalty really do you okay. uh, yeah. you know we're, we're used to seeing old english royalty all the time in movies you yeah. know you, you, yeah but you don't get too much of this and catherine the great was a very determined very ruthless in her own way leader and we see that in this movie okay. um so to have that mixed in with possibly my favourite actor-director partnership ever, mm -hmm. one of certainly, yeah, then, you know, for, for con <laughs> it is a bold statement, but for consistency, for amount of movies, for just pure, you know, great movie after great movie after great mm -hmm. movie and innovative after innovative after innovative movie as well. Um, Von Sternberg and Dietrich in, in in those in the early thirties are great, and like I said, this was the this was the last movie in a run for okay. them, and perhaps encapsulates everything they did up to that point okay. um, in just you know the 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 perfect way. Yeah. I think the Scarlet Empress nineteen thirty five is a a wonderful wonderful movie. Okay, it really is. If you like that kind of yeah. thing. Okay. Definitely. Nice. Very different to something <laughs> the law made. Yes, very different. As far as historical biopics go. But yes, 
There we go. What about spy movies then, <laughs> Um, Well, you had to know I'm not going to be picking some kind of serious spy movie. Oh, um, okay. So I went with uh, a spy versus spy rom-com. <laughs> okay. We know what this and is. Do we know what this, this is? This means war. This means war. Oh, okay. With, uh, Chris Pine and Tom Hardy, they're both best friends and spies who end up dating the same woman, uh, Reese Witherspoon, and uh, end up kind of using their spy tech against each other <laughs> to one up each other in dating Reese Witherspoon. So it's a lot of fun. Uh, people, I don't I, like people hate on this movie. Um, I don't think it did very well. I think even Tom Hardy kind of hates it because it's just so different from anything he did. But that's why I love it because I love seeing him be kind of a fun rom-com person. And like, he's actually really good at it. So <laughs> that he hates it. Okay. Like, oh, it makes me sad, but he's really fun in this movie. And we never see Tom Hardy be too much fun. I think the most fun we've gotten him since this movie was probably like in the Venom movies. But um. Yeah, like I think it, it's really funny how they use their spy tech against each other. Um, there's a lot of fun little in joke type things, um, and their dynamic is really cute. I think their chemistry is really great. Like the two guys, <laughs> you know, um, they feel like best friends that have known each other forever. Um, and yeah, it's just it's just so much fun. Like I love that movie. But okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> show, show, show love to show love to these. This means war. Yes, like yes. Two hardcore spies who end up, you know, end up just wasting their spy skills on just messing with each other the whole time. Okay, I like, I, I like yes. the idea. I, I it probably like depicts of one of the most romantic looking dates I've ever seen. Uh, yeah. So okay. Yeah, so okay, if you want to see cute, cute, light Tom Hardy, watch this movie. <laughs> then, well, yes, there we go. I mean, uh, m my choice for a spy movie is, is is rather different again to to your choice. Um, it's from the thirties. Um, it's 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 actually not something that you'll laugh at Janine because it's a movie you like very much it's kind of a low-key spy movie you don't necessarily realize it's a spy movie until a certain point it's the lady vanishes Hitchcock's oh. the lady vanishes which starts off as just like a, a, a mystery yeah really. almost a, a Brit noir mystery mm -hmm. um, early I suppose because it's not really technically noir because it's in the 30s um of course you know, Michael Redgrave and um, Margaret Lockwood are on the train. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, old, old little May Witty as well, who we just love, who is the old lady. It's that, the lady course, who vanishes. <laughs> um, who, you know, Margaret Lockwood meets and speaks to, has a nice conversation with, but then vanishes and nobody on the train has seen her. Seen nobody her. on the train yeah. knew she existed. Um, you think she's going insane? It's a Hitchcock movie, so yeah. you get you get all the great. I think it's Hitchcock's best thirties movie as well that I've seen. Like definitely, yeah. like I know the Thirty Nine Steps is a very loved, more pure spy movie from this time from Hitchcock. I watched the Thirty Nine Steps a few years ago. I couldn't really get into it too much. Perhaps I'm due a rewatch. Perhaps, but. The Lady Vanishes, I think, because it's almost a secret spy movie. Yeah. You know, it doesn't show itself as being a spy movie. It is a mystery at its core about finding out, is Margaret Lockwood actually going insane? Did she hallucinate the entire thing? Yeah. Or is there something more sinister at play here where there's a reason that she only spoke to her and... Where's she gone? What are we trying to do here? It's all yeah. very secretive. Hitchcock does a great job, obviously, at creating that tension, creating that suspense. Yeah. Never making you aware of exactly what's going on. Always just showing you exactly what he needs to show you. Just, yeah. Right up until it's all revealed to be a big spy plot. Yes. And a big espionage thing. Um, 
a secret spy movie because I think that's my favorite type of spy movie. I was looking through all, you know, kind of lists of spy movies and mm -hmm. there was a lot that I, I, I want to see. I think there was a few that I have seen, certainly kind of older ones. You could have said something like The Manchurian Candidate, which is a great, great oh, yeah. movie. Mm -hmm. I think we did a deja vu on movie. that. We did. I believe we also very, covered very... this one on the podcast as well. We did, yes. We did mm -hmm. cover The Lady Vanishes. Yeah, uh, But Manchurian Candidate, a very, very dark movie, obviously. A brainwashed type spy movie. Communist brainwashed type spy movie from the early 60s, of course, in the height of the Cold War and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, that is more of a pure spy movie than, you know, with what we think about spy movies. Yeah. Um, but I think maybe aside from aside from Bond, which I obviously like, and, and now Mission Impossible and things like that, I prefer secret spy movies mystery movies that turn into spy movies rather than kind of just i'm a spy and i'm doing a job you know yeah i i i, I there's there's elements of that that i do like but i don't know i was looking through a lot of them and i was just like i've got no desire to see that i've heard of it and i've heard of that and i've heard of that i just don't really want to watch any of these movies because I, I do, maybe I don't love spy movies. Maybe not. You know, maybe I maybe I just don't love spy movies. But I was looking as well, and something like Three Days of the Condor, I'd be interested in seeing Robert okay. Redford. But there's some that are just like I don't care. I don't care about that. Yeah. And it was weird to, for me to think like that. So. I think I need secret spy movies, so I decided to pick a secret spy movie. Okay. You could well, also pick him. virtually. You could also pick a lot of Fritz Lang movies. Yeah. Uh, Ministry of Fear with Ray Milland, Spy Own, which I think is how you pronounce it, <laughs> or which which is just the German for spies, which is okay. from 1928, which is what he made for cheap after Metropolis didn't do well Ooh. financially. Yeah. Um, I own that movie. <laughs> or That's just all the kind of other, the anti-Nazi Fritz Lang movies. They're they're kind of good spy movies because the war the wartime spy movies and it's always about secret kind of yeah thing plots going on and things like that. Um, but yes, or I did see mentioned the. Uh, remake that we didn't do as a deja vu for the big clock, which was No Way Ooh. Out with Kevin Costner. Yeah. From 87, which I think is more of a spy movie than, than or more, or at least than, more of a. Than the original. At least more of a political plot movie than um, than the big clock is, which is really just more of a, in, you know, anti institution kind yeah. of noir mystery. But. Yeah. I saw that as well. Anyway, anyway, <laughs> the lady vanishes. It's a great, yeah. No, it's a, it's a good one. It's one of my it favorite. Really yeah, it's one of my favorite Hitchcocks for sure. It's maybe not your favorite Hitchcock uh, spy movie, though. What wouldn't that be notorious? I love Notorious. I do. <laughs> I really do. The ending is perfect. It's perfect. Notorious is great. Notorious, I think, is the is the perfect kind of romance spy movie yes i mean i almost picked it but then i'm like i'm just gonna go for the silly rom-com and advocate for this movie that people don't talk about or didn't like when i thought it was a solid rom-com and really fun yes. so that is a fair point that is a very <laughs> yes. very fair point well we did say it wouldn't be a too long of a let's talk today but janine let's finish with some fun and games what do you have for me today well since you know napoleon has this in a very historical mood i'm gonna ask you yes. some questions about um historical figures in film okay Ooh, <laughs> this is this is gonna be interesting am i gonna be terrible at this am so i, I going five, to show myself I, up again i have five questions based around um historical figures in movies okay okay Okay. All right. Are you ready? 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Question one. Name three actors who have played Wyatt Earp. Three actors who have played Wyatt Earp. Henry Fonda. Um, uh, Kurt Russell. And... Uh, 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 who was Wyatt? Uh, this should be easy. This should be Bert easy. Lancaster. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Also Kevin Costner. Also Kevin Costner, of course. <laughs> okay. In in the same vein, <laughs> name three actors who have played Doc Holiday. <laughs> oh, so Kirk Douglas. <laughs> um, who was Doc Holiday in My Darling Clementine? Um, oh god, Val Kilmer, obviously, yeah. Yes. And who was Kevin Costner's Doc Holiday? <laughs> <laughs> and who was Doc Holiday in my darling Clever site? Oh no. No, why don't I know that? Why can I only pick two Doc Holidays? No, this is not good. Oh my gosh. I can no. only pick two. I can't think of who Kevin Costner's Doc Come Holiday on. is. I can't. We we love him. We love him. He is a standout to us. I can't. I, I don't know. I don't okay. know. All don't right. Know. Okay. Well, well, Kevin Costner's was Dennis Quaid. Dennis Quaid. And my darling Clementine's was Victor Mature. It's Victor Mature. It's been so long yes. since I've seen my darling Clementine. Yes. Okay. Yes. We do like Victor Mature. Yes. We do. Okay. Question three. How many films has Angela Bassett appeared in featuring a depiction of Betty Shabazz, wife of Malcolm X? How many movies has Angela Bassett appeared in that feature an a depiction, a from depiction of Betty Shabazz, oh God. Malcolm X's wife? I mean, it's always one more than you think, three. That is correct. Oh, she yes. played her. She played her in both Malcolm X and Panther. Uh, okay. And she was in a movie called Betty and Coretta, where she played, or okay. she actually played Coretta Scott King, and Mary J. Blige played Betty Shabazz. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yes. I knew, of course, Malcolm X. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, name five actors who have played Oof. who have played JFK. <laughs> JFK. JFK. I could give you Nixon. Um <laughs> five actors who have played JFK. I mean, if uh, you if you were a fan of my TikToks, you'd be able to answer this pretty well because I have a whole is, theory about go how TikTok. Uncle Ben should be played. Uncle Ben. <laughs> See, I'm giving oh, you some yes, right of now. Course you do. Right. <laughs> My yes. Uncle Ben theory. Okay. Martin Sheen. <laughs> um Cliff Robertson. Yes. Um, so there's two. Mm -hmm. JFK. Who played no, nobody played JFK and JFK. It was about the afterwards. Um unless somebody did play JFK JFK. I don't know. I don't know that many JFKs, you know. I really don't. Who's someone who always plays the president? <laughs> always plays the president. Uh, Bruce Greenwood. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, of course it is. <laughs> of course it is. Someone else who always plays the president. Martin Sheen. Yes, we've already gone with Martin Sheen. Yes. Two more. Um, oh, JFK. JFK. Think... Somebody play JFK in... Mc... Somebody played JFK in X Men. No, they didn't. Yes, they must have done. <laughs> Who was that? That wasn't Bruce Greenwood. I don't know. I genuinely don't. I need clues. Um. I don't watch that many JFK movies. Clearly. Um, I was giving this person lots of love earlier in the show. Earlier in the oh god. Earlier in the show, what, what have we talked about? <laughs> um, earlier in the show. Yes. 
Oh, oh, someone from the Emmys. Um, James Marsden. Yes. <laughs> James Marsden has played JFK. Mm-hmm. When and how? Um, <laughs> yeah, I really don't know. I need another clue. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh my gosh. You can, you can, you can tell me off for not doing no knowing presidential uh, depictions that well. Um. Oh, I think he played JFK in the Butler, in Lee Daniels, the Butler. No, oh, in the Butler. Yes. Um. Oh. One of them was in a TV version, so if you don't get it, but if you had watched my video of of potential uh, Uncle Ben's for Marissa Tomei, they were Uncle. all kind of age. They were all kind of age appropriate attractive appropriate uncle ben's to match her marissa tomei Aunt timothy Bain. oliphant no he seems like a jfk attractive kind of type no i don't know who's this other person then um so we have greg kinnear greg and kinnear. rob lowe also played him rob and the lowe. one who played him in a tv movie was patrick dempsey Okay, okay. <laughs> Greg Kinney, I can see that that makes sense. Rob Lowe, I'm not too sure about playing JFK, to be I honest think, with you. Yeah, I think he, he kind of gives off the vibe. Maybe maybe at a certain time in history, it depends when that depiction was. Or when he when Rob Lowe how how old Rob Lowe was, I mean. Yeah, he was he was fairly that. young still. Okay. okay. Name five movies about British historical figures. Just any five movies about British mm-hmm. historical, Brit, just any British historical figure. Yes, I'm going to give you, I'm going to time you. Oh, God. <laughs> Don't do that. Yes, I'm going to time you. I'm going to give you 20 seconds. To, for five, any British historical figure. You're now British. You should about... know. You love history yeah. and you're British. You should... I'm aware of that, but now I've got to compartmentalize okay, who I'll I choose. You, I'll give you 30 seconds. And go. Uh, Elizabeth, the Queen, um, Darkest Hour, um, The Private Life of Henry VIII, and a man for all seasons. There you go. Wow, no lion in winter. No lion in winter. See that? that I had to choose. <laughs> I was picking Tudors. Then that's what I was. Picking. Yes, I'm like you're gonna go and for the I, Royals. I, I was picking Tudors, and then I went a little bit World War Two, yes. and then I went a little bit yes. Queen Elizabeth. I didn't now. expect you. Yeah, Not I didn't now. expect you to go for Iron Ladies or the King's Speech. No, of course. <laughs> too too new. For <laughs> the queen was only 2006 that's when that came out okay fair well good job um, morgan thank you pretty good thank you, you pretty good. thank you <laughs> thank you didn't didn't really show myself up there apart from on the jfk yeah apart from on the jfk front but there we go i think janine for today's episode of monday madness it has been episode 50 we've had a wonderful time as we always do yes. on this show of course though it is not the only show we have on the it's a wonderful podcast feed nor is it the only thing we have on this youtube channel as we did have that exciting announcement before of uh, the spin-off of morgan hasn't seen talking about tv shows coming to this channel um in the next few weeks or actually probably next week and the week after so there you go um, subscribe, ding your notification bells on this YouTube channel if you are watching here. If you are not watching and you are just listening, go on over to the It's a Wonderful Podcast YouTube channel and subscribe and ding your notification bell, of course, for all of the fun stuff we do have on the channel. But of course, we have Morgan Hasn't Seen every Wednesday on the podcast feed. Mission Impossible is in full discussion over there, as we said. And that is where our dead reckoning discussion will be at the end of the month. We also, of course, have the main show. It's a wonderful podcast itself. Showing love to those old movies that I have done as well today. 
every single Friday on every episode of the main show. It's always a fun time discovering new old movies and just giving them a platform to say, hey, this exists, go and see it. It's great just because it's from 80 years ago. It doesn't mean you shouldn't <laughs> yes. watch it. Give them you some know. love. Give them some love indeed. There have been things scrolling down at the bottom of the screen as well, including the donation and uh, and Patreon link, which are in the description. Um, if you would like to join us there, we, we would be most grateful for that generous uh, joining. Generous joining, that doesn't make sense. Is it Gen generous patronage of... It's a wonderful podcast. We love them all dearly, our patrons, and we can't do what we do without their support. What else do I have to say? I'm all messed up with the plugs now. <laughs> you can find the show on Twitter at It's a Wonderful One. You can find me on Twitter at The Purple Dawn with a three instead of the E and the because, Janine. Three is the magic number. On Instagram and TikTok at the Purple Don, all your Wonka hating stuff is where. <laughs> you can find me, Janine Debean underscore on Twitter, Janine Debean on Instagram and TikTok. If you want to get any merch for any of our shows, the link has been scrolling by, or you can check the description or just search It's a Wonderful Podcast on teespring.com. We have some really fun designs over there, some fun Stranger Things designs, some logos for all of our shows. So if you want some merch, check it out. And if you want to purchase any of my art in print form, you can find that at my big cartel shop, g9design.bigcartel.com. There we go. That's it. There's no more left to do. Happy 50th Yay. to Monday Madness. It's great <laughs> to be at 50 episodes of this yes. very nonsensical show <laughs> that we do on Mondays here. Janine, there is only one thing left to do. Is there any fun impression Napoleon, Wonka, actual good Willy Wonka, though, please. Like, I can't do a good Wonka. How would, how would how would Gene Wilder's Willy Wonka say countdown from three to one? He'd probably just sound like Gene Wilder, which is the. It's not. It's not really a fun impression, is yeah, it? You need to no. sell. I'll just both so, sound like Timothy Chalamet, like bland and boring. Don't want that. <laughs> no. don't want that. Well, do whatever you want, then. You can count us down. It's very exciting. Yay! Three. One. It sounded more like an umpa lumpa. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Yeah. <laughs>